This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Fluorescentesis is used diagnostically to establish the cause of a pleural effusion. It can also be performed to drain large effusions that lead to respiratory compromise. Limited data exist regarding the safety of thoracentesis in patients with coagulation abnormalities. The procedure is probably safe in patients with mild or moderate elevations of the prothrombin time or partial thromboplastin time. The decision to use fresh frozen plasma or platelet concentrates in patients with clinically significant coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia must be made on an individual basis. The procedure should be used with care in patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation since positive pressure ventilation may bring the lung close to the thoracentesis needle and increase the risk of pneumothorax. Thoracentesis should be deferred in patients with severe hemodynamic or respiratory compromise until the underlying condition can be stabilized. In patients who have small or loculated effusions, the procedure should be performed by experienced operators, ideally with real-time imaging guidance. The thoracentesis needle should not pass through sites of cutaneous infection, such as cellulitis or herpes zoster. Numerous devices, which are frequently available in prepackaged kits, can be used to perform thoracentesis. You should become familiar with the specific devices available at your institution. In this video, we will use a standard intravenous over-the-needle catheter assembly to demonstrate the procedure. For sterile preparation of the site and administration of anesthesia, you will need a skin cleansing agent, sterile gauze, sterile gloves, a sterile drape, a hemostat, which is optional, 1 or 2 percent lidocaine, and a 10 milliliter syringe with a 22 to 25 gauge needle. For the collection of pleural fluid, you will need an 18 to 20 gauge over the needle catheter, a 60 milliliter syringe, and a three-way stopcock. You will also need sterile drainage tubing, specimen tubes and a large evacuated container, and a sterile occlusive dressing. Explain the procedure to the patient and obtain written informed consent. You should also verify the patient's identity, mark the correct site, and conduct a pre-procedural timeout. The timeout, which takes place immediately before the procedure is started, consists of confirmation by all members of the care team that the patient's identity, the procedure he or she is to undergo, and the site of the procedure are all correct. You will need an assistant to help position and monitor the patient and assist with the collection of pleural fluid. Place the patient in a sitting position on the edge of the bed with his or her arms resting on a table. The height of the effusion is determined by auscultation and percussion of the posterior chest wall. With a skin marking pen, mark the needle insertion site. The site should be 5 to 10 centimeters lateral to the spine and at least one or two intercostal spaces below the top of the effusion. The needle should not be inserted below the ninth rib. If available, bedside ultrasonography can be used to help visualize the effusion. In the patient in this video, the pleural effusion is easily visualized, as are the ipsilateral lung and the liver. Prepare the area with antiseptic solution and apply a sterile drape. Using a 25 gauge needle, place a wheel of local anesthetic such as lidocaine along the superior edge of the rib that lies below the selected intercostal space. Switch to a 22 gauge needle and begin to anesthetize the deeper tissues. The inferior surface of the rib must be avoided since the intercostal vessels and nerve are located in this region. At this point, Walk the needle over the superior aspect of the rib, alternately injecting anesthetic and pulling back on the plunger as you advance. Once the needle enters the pleural space, pleural fluid will begin to fill the syringe. Inject more anesthetic at this point to anesthetize the highly sensitive parietal pleura. Note the depth of penetration and then withdraw the needle. 
If available, a hemostat may be attached to the exposed portion of the needle to mark the depth of the pleural space. Attach an 18 gauge over the needle catheter to a syringe and advance it along the superior surface of the rib. Keep pulling back on the plunger as you proceed to the predetermined depth of the pleural space. Once fluid is aspirated, immediately stop advancing the needle and guide the plastic catheter over the needle. When the catheter is fully inserted, remove the needle as the patient exhales or hums. The exposed hub of the catheter should be covered immediately with your finger to prevent the entry of air into the pleural space. Next, attach the three-way stopcock and large syringe to the catheter and continue to aspirate fluid. When this syringe is full, adjust the stopcock so that it is closed to the patient. The stopcock should be open to the patient only when fluid is being actively drained. If additional fluid needs to be drained for therapeutic purposes, attach the collection tubing to the stopcock and to the evacuated container. Open the stopcock to the patient and to the tubing and allow the evacuated container to fill. Generally, you should remove no more than 1,500 milliliters of pleural fluid. The removal of larger volumes may result in post-expansion pulmonary edema. On completion of fluid collection, you should rapidly remove the catheter as the patient holds his or her breath at end expiration. Cover the needle insertion site with an occlusive dressing and clean the surrounding skin. At the end of the procedure, make sure that all needles are placed into appropriate safety devices. Aspirated fluid should be placed in specimen tubes before the large evacuated container is filled or while it is filling. A tube without additives should be used for chemical analyses such as the measurement of lactic dehydrogenase, protein, and glucose levels. An EDTA-treated tube should be used for the cell count and differential count. Specimens for cytologic and microbiologic analyses and for other tests may be required depending on the clinical circumstances. These are discussed in further detail in the accompanying written supplement. Analysis of the pleural fluid will help differentiate a transudate, which is commonly caused by congestive heart failure or cirrhosis, from an exudate, which may be caused by processes such as bacterial pneumonia, cancer, or trauma. Pneumothorax is uncommon after thoracentesis and, when present, it rarely requires the placement of a chest tube. Chest radiographs are not required after simple, uncomplicated procedures. Radiography of the chest should be performed if air was aspirated during the procedure, if chest pain, dyspnea, or hypoxemia develops, or if the patient is critically ill or undergoing mechanical ventilation. Other complications of thoracentesis include pain, coughing, and localized infection. More serious complications include hemothorax, intra-abdominal organ injury, air embolism, and post-expansion pulmonary edema.